So again, welcome to the session Towards a Feminist Finance Pact, which is a teach-in and strategy session unpacking the Bridgetown Initiative and relevant other things that are happening in the, the global economic and, and climate sphere that are and will affect us as feminists um, and as people who care about justice for people and planet. Um, we're very pleased to have all of you with us today. We would love it if you could introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, please share your name, where you're coming from in terms of organization or affiliation, what country you're based in, if you'd like to share a couple of your key areas of work. And then we'd love to hear what brings you to this session today. So I'll start. My name is Katie Tobin. I'm a senior program manager at WeDo, the Women's Environment and Development Organization, which is a global advocacy org based in New York, although we operate globally. Um, I also help to convene the Feminist Action Nexus for Economic and Climate Justice, which is one of the co-hosts of this meeting. And I'm here because I think it's really important that we understand these initiatives that are happening and the discussions that are going on behind the scenes um, among our governments and our multilateral institutions. And I'm really excited to strategize and critique it and understand it best with all of you. So please do put your intros in the chat. Thank you so much. And a little bit more about who we are in terms of the conveners of this meeting. So the Action Nexus that I just mentioned um, is an initiative that was formed just a couple of years ago to amplify and connect the feminist perspectives amongst the economic justice movement and the climate justice movement. Um, we convene meetings like this one. We develop advocacy briefs. We're trying to really... Um, see how we can best make connections and, and amplify work that's already happening across economic and climate justice um, with a particular focus on, on feminist structural analysis and, and challenging the status quo. Um, the Feminist Action Nexus is co-convened by the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development, FEMNET, and the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, as well as we do. Um, so really pleased to have my colleagues from the Action Nexus here today. And um, we're building on some successful collaboration with the Women and Gender constituency around COP and beyond. So we're really pleased to be co-hosting this session with the Women and Gender constituency, um, which is the official stakeholder group of the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, working on gender, working to promote and advance the rights and voices of women in the UNFCCC processes. So we have um, our wonderful colleagues from the Women and Gender Constituency Facilitative Committee with us to help facilitate some of our breakouts. Um, and we have my colleague Zukiswa White, who's the coordinator of the WGC, um, who's helping co-host the Zoom with me. So thanks, Zukiswa. So that's who's convening this session, but we really want it to be a space um, for all of us to share about our work and our perspectives and to really unpack what, what is the Bridgetown Initiative? What is this um, Paris Summit that's coming up in just a couple of weeks for a new global financial pact and why they matter um, to our work and how they impact the, the discussions and the policy spaces that we are active in, whether that be the UNFCCC COP and the bond intercessionals happening next week, that's why we're having this meeting this week, whether that be the IFIs, the World Bank IMF annual meetings, um, we're already getting ready for those coming up in October in Marrakesh. Um, Bridgetown was also a topic at the spring meetings. Um, there's the, the regional climate weeks, there's of course, COP28 itself in Dubai at the end of the year. So all of these spaces um, will be impacted by this idea of the Bridgetown Initiative. And we thought it was really important to take a step back and figure out, first of all, what is it? Because it's it's not straightforward. It's, you know, there've been three different versions at least so far of what the Bridgetown Initiative is. There's another version circulating that we haven't seen yet. That was sent to governments ahead of the 
uh, Paris summit. So it's it's complicated enough to figure out what is actually being proposed by Barbados through the Bridgetown Initiative. And then um, what it means for both the climate and the development or economic justice spaces. Because I think one of the characterizing factors of Bridgetown is that it kind of collapses the distinction between the climate process and climate finance over here, and then the more kind of financing for development or development finance um, or economic justice IFI space over here. And while that makes sense to an extent, it's also dangerous. And so we really want to understand what that kind of squishing together of climate and development that Bridgetown does means for us as the climate movement, as the economic justice movement, as people who care about both of these issues. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we want to start to understand what impact Bridgetown is going to have, is already having on the policy spaces that we engage in. And then what does it mean that there are these spaces and discussions happening outside the multilateral system that we track and that we follow um, that have that will have significant impact and we don't have access to these spaces. We're not part of these conversations where we're struggling to even understand. So how can we make sure that we are able to track and then influence those spaces? And what does this kind of further erosion of multilateralism mean for our work? Um, and how is Bridgetown and the summit contributing to that? And then I think the part of the conversation that we're gonna have today that's really exciting is how do these proposals interface with our own feminist systemic structural analysis. We have our own progressive and feminist proposals. I can see, you know, based on who's in the room, how much expertise and experience there is at national level, at global level. Thank you for bringing your perspectives to this discussion. Um, and so how can we make sure that our own systemic structural feminist justice oriented proposals um, can, can also be part of this conversation that we, from the perspective of um, working towards a more equitable and just world um, that addresses climate change, that redresses climate change and other historical and ongoing injustices. Um, how can our kind of ongoing proposals for economic and financial governance, for climate justice, for gender justice, also take up space in these initiatives as they're also, or in these, these global policy spaces so that it's not just kind of yet another innovative financing proposal or invitation to the private sector, um, et cetera. So how can we make sure that our own proposals are also part of this conversation? So that's the sort of reason we're here today. We're gonna learn together. We're gonna share experiences analysis, we're going to unpack what is the Bridgetown Initiative, what does it mean, and we're going to gather as feminists to build collective understanding as, as a foundation for collective advocacy to challenge the prevailing direction and to reorient it towards, towards justice for people and planet. A um, couple other things we have in the pipeline related to this, I wrote to those of you who registered to share a draft of our Bridgetown explainer brief. I'll also put that in the chat in a moment, um, which is just kind of doing the same thing we're doing here, unpacking what is this thing? What might it mean for our work? What are our critiques of it? What proposals do we have instead? So we'll be updating that and publishing it um, and translating it before the Paris summit. And then we're also just trying to see how we can work together to engage in these global policy spaces um, and really amplify our, our own feminist systemic proposals through some communications work, perhaps an op-ed, through potentially collaborating on advocacy, we'll see. Um, so that's kind of what, what we're here together today to discuss. So here's how it's gonna work. We've got the first 40 minutes, um, we have a teach-in. So we're gonna hear from two really wonderful colleagues who have been following this um, to explain what is the Bridgetown Initiative and some related, related processes like the Paris Summit. What are they actually proposing? Why does it matter? 
What's our critique? What are we concerned about with these proposals? Um, what, if any, opportunities do they raise for kind of breaking open some space to talk about real systemic alternatives? Um, so we'll hear first from Maria Jose Romero, who's the policy and advocacy manager for development finance at Eurodev for about 15 minutes. And then we'll hear from David Williams, who's the International Climate Justice Program Director at Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. So we'll hear from more of an economic justice expert and more of a climate justice expert. And hopefully that will start us off with a really good solid foundation for understanding what Bridgetown is and what it could mean for the issues that we care about. Then we're gonna have a strategy session. So our bridge from the teach into the strategy session will be hearing from our colleague Melania Chaponda from Feminine, and Mela will walk us through some of her own feminist analysis from an economic and climate justice perspective, as well as helping us to digest what we learned in the teach in and then start to think about our own, um, our own analysis and approach as we break into the strategy session. So we have 40 minutes for breakout groups. Um, we have three questions to share, which I sent um, over email, so you could also think about them, thinking about what our own feminist demands would be around Bridgetown, what concerns do we have, do we want to start thinking about some collective advocacy, and we have a Padlet, which for those of you who haven't used it before is a really nice way of working collaborati co collaboratively, excuse me, and sharing um, resources and ideas, and we can also do some joint strategizing about the upcoming policy spaces and who's going to be in them. So when we get to that, I'll explain the breakouts a bit more. Um, then we'll come for a report back and wrap up and, and discuss next steps. So the whole thing will take about two hours total. And um, I think that's enough introduction. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. If you have issues with interpretation, please put it in the chat. We have a group of people ready to support and ensure that, that everything goes well today. So thank you so much. And we're now moving into the teach-in portion. And I'm very happy to give the floor to Maria Jose from Eurodad for about 15 minutes. I'm going to stop my share so that MJ can share her slides. Maria Jose, over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everyone. Thanks a lot for um, the invitation to participate in the uh, session. Let me run presentation like this. Um, okay, it's, it's great to be here uh, today with you. Uh, I am... Uh, uh, seen in the uh, participants list, uh, the amazing group of people that we have uh, uh, today, and 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 it's uh, and it's uh, great uh, to to have this opportunity to provide some input. Um, this session uh, also uh, follows uh, on two sessions that uh, you're done together with many other uh, partners, included in this um, group, um, organized. Uh, on, similar topics. Uh, the last one was last week, where we discussed um, some of the things that uh, we will be discussing today. Right, and in my uh, 15 minutes, um, I will run through um, three main things. First, a very brief introduction on the context. Then I will get into the key features, the concerns, and some unanswered questions that we have on three key proposals uh, on the table, uh, which are the um, uh, multilateral development banks uh, reform, right? Exemplified by the World Bank Group um, evolution roadmap. Uh, the second one is uh, the Bridge Town Initiative. And the third one is uh, the Paris Summit and the new pack. Uh, that it's being discussed around the summit uh, taking place uh, in one month. And then I will close with some um, points on the way forward. 
Uh, okay, so when it comes to the context, I would like to share with you some very brief remarks on pre and post COVID-19 pandemic uh, context. Because uh, um, what we have seen is that over the last decade, there has been a, a private turn in, in development finance uh, with significant implications for the achievement of the SDGs, for um, uh, the Paris Agreement, for meeting commitments made in Paris, and for a right-based um, agenda, including an agenda focused on um, women's uh, rights. Um, and by this uh, private turn in development finance, what I mean is that there has been a very strong narrative that um, uh, it's based in two major assumptions, right? Uh, the first one is that the financing of the SDGs requires a massive uh, amount of investment. And the second one is that <clears throat> public finance is not enough to deliver on, on those. On that basis, there is uh, there, and there are uh, quite uh, strong claims that say that uh, we uh, have a very big financing gap that needs to be filled with private finance, and that using public finance and institutions to leverage private finance is basically the way to go for uh, development finance. And and I said at the beginning that these are two big assumptions. Uh, because um, there is a political choice uh, there, right? This reflects a strong political uh, option because uh, we are in front of the unwillingness of the international uh, community to scale up and strengthen public financing of, of development, including by meeting international agreed commitments to deliver 0.7% um, uh, of national income in, in aid, uh, tackling international tax avoidance and evasion effectively, um, agreeing on mechanism for debt cancellation and debt restructuring, meeting climate uh, finance uh, commitments, um, and many more, right? I have just listed four that the international development community have not been able to address it openly, but there are many more systemic things that um, uh, put us in this particular position that we are today. In March 2020, uh, we um, had the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic exposed and even amplified some of the problems that we saw before. In February, Last year, 2022, we experienced the spillover effect um, and many other uh, problems associated with the war in Ukraine. So we are since then, we have been since then in, in a poly crisis context. And this uh, takes me to my second point, which is these uh, three proposals that we have on the table, right? Because um, after that there has been very strong calls for reform, right? Um, that have emerged from different ends and have materialized in different but closely interconnected proposals. And as I said at the beginning, we are uh, now going to discuss, uh, I am now going to discuss these three main ones, right? The first one is uh, the one that has to do with uh, multilateral development banks. The second one, Bridgetown, and the third one, um, the, the Paris uh, Summit. When it comes to the, um, the MDB reform and the World Bank Evolution Roadmap, I listed that uh, first because this is work that was initiated in 2021 by the G20 when the C20 commissioned a group of experts to uh, um, assess the work of multilateral development banks. And um, this uh, um, expert group they, uh, released in July last year uh, a report that was focused on what is called um, capital adequacy framework. Basically, what is the money that multilateral development banks 
uh, have at their disposal and how they structure the business model to um, do um, what they do. And then uh, last year, um, rich uh, countries, main shareholders of the World Bank, push the World Bank to deliver an action plan to uh, implement some of these reforms or assess the possibility of implementing some of these reforms. This uh, plan was um, released in December uh, last year and was followed by an updated report in March this year. What's the main objective of this agenda? Uh, it is to ensure that the World Bank Group is up to the challenge of the current context, particularly around climate change, fragility, and, grow, and growing global health uh, threats. But when we dig into all the technicalities of the documents, what we see is that the main focus of this is increasing financing without requiring shareholders to contribute more, but relying on a new uh, resource, lending from capital market, as well as enhancing hybrid capital, such as blended finance. Um, the World Bank Evolution Roadmap includes certainly some new approaches, including labeling climate as a global public good, um, scaling up uh, finance from all sources, and an enhanced role for private sector development, as well as focus on middle-income countries. But in the essence, what we are in front of, it's an agenda that it's about mobilizing money from the private, from the private sector. The, the last point that I mentioned, which is a focus on uh, middle-income countries, is the one that connects us to the Bridgetown uh, Initiative, which is an evolving proposal introduced by Prime Minister Mia Motley from Barbados, and that was very um, uh, hot on the press and on the news uh, last year before COP27. Um, and this uh, uh, proposal um, is propelled by the strong critique that Nia Motley has, and has been very outspoken on, on, on that, of the obstacles countries like hers face to raise finance for development and climate change and the need for reform of the international financial architecture. Certainly, she has been very, very vocal on that last, on, on, on these two points. It seeks to break the deadlock in access to climate finance, especially for small island development states. And it proposed uh, two main things, increasing uh, liquidity via special drawing rights, which are an, an asset held by the IMF, and um, increasing lending, primarily through multilateral development banks, and here we are again, a point that connects the two agendas that I had been talking about. The proposal, the Bridge Town Initiative uh, has now gone through several changes. Katie mentioned that there has been quite a lot of iterations of the same document with some proposals being dropped, including the most progressive ones and, and some others gaining some more emphasis, right? For example, mobilizing private finance in support of green transition. As Bridgetown 2.0 continues to be reworked in, in private discussions, it is quite likely that its orientation will continue to shift to become more attractive for Global North power brokers and their private investors. And here um, we are uh, in front of one of the main concerns that that we, that we have with this proposal. Number three, the new global financial pact as a proposal led by the current French government and uh, the current uh, uh, French government, uh, it's uh, very outspoken saying that he's taking the lead from Prime Minister Mia Mokli. Um, the communication on the summit so far emphasized the need for a global, financing uh, pact to address climate change, biodiversity, and development challenges. And the pact consists of four pillars. The first one, restoration of fiscal space to countries. Number two, fostering um, of private sector development in low-income countries. 
Number three, mobilizing finance for climate change, particularly um, innovative financing. And number four, encouraging green infrastructure for energy, energy transition. As we wait for more details on the concrete policies under the PAC, because quite a lot of this is currently being discussed, it is very important here to mention that many in civil society question the feasibility of the summit's uh, ambition and, and consider the summit uh, and the, the process leading to the summit as such, uh, nothing more than a distraction from fundamental discussions on the structural obstacles to financing for development for countries in the global south. Some of the initial um, obstacles and, and problems that I highlighted at the very beginning. Um, so with the three proposals of, on the table, what are our main concerns with, with them? Um, First is that the three proposals focus on increasing financing and responding to the needs in the context of the ongoing pandemic, war, et cetera, right? However, we argue that the common thread uh, between these three proposals is the seemingly blind faith in financial market and the role of the state that these three proposals advocate for which is um, a, a, an estate that is reduced to de-risking private investment for development and climate change. And this has at least five main implications or, or concerns from uh, a right-based perspective. The first one has to do with the process, right? We are in front of three policy processes uh, with poor or, or lack of uh, meaningful civil society participation. The second one is that, um, in, in essence, they claim or, or they are asking for an expanded role of lending, which is especially problematic in an area of high interest rates, as well as uh, piecemeal, chaotic, and unending processes of the restructuring. Um, number three is that, as I said before, they claim or they promote a very problematic notion of the role of the state, where development is a question of how we de-risk investment instead of how we deliver on, on development goals and uh, ensure that rights are at home. Uh, number four is the distributional impact. And, and this is a major one. Uh, fiscal resources dedicated to the risking can be stifled, as in the case of public-private partnerships. And the quasi or even full privatization of public goods may restrict uh, universal access. And this is very problematic from, from a rights based perspective. Number, number five is the promotion of policy is that the promotion of policies aimed to encourage Paris alignment risk pushing forward um, green structural adjustment. Right? And by this, uh, I mean that uh, now uh, we might be in front of IMF and World Bank policy conditions that push countries to um, uh, adjust to um, the green uh, transition path uh, in cases where they might be in a different situation than other countries and they will have their policy space uh, reduced um, as it happened in the 80s and 90s now with conditions that are called uh, green. So here we are with the concerns, but um, we are also in front of some unanswered questions, and I will list just three. Uh, first, is a bigger World Bank group a guarantee for better and more effective development models? I will certainly reply uh, negatively to, to this question because only a fundamental governance reform can change problematic power dynamics that have pushed us to be in the situation that we are now. Number two, what about the effects of South North's bleeding of finance? And here again, the issue of illicit financial flows, corporate tax, tax dodging, et cetera. Uh, with none of these proposals, we are tackling some of these, right? And number three, what about existing donor commitments on development aid and, and climate finance? 
Again, none of these proposals ensure that we um, work in, in that particular um, direction, um, uh, even um, the contrary. Um, I will close with just some points on the way forward. Um, first is that we certainly need more financing, right? But claims that we are in front of a massive financing gap um, can, be, can be challenged, right? Um, and it's true that what is needed might not be, and, and I would say that for sure is not uh, private finance for, for development. Greater international concessional public finance is needed, especially for, for, climate, for climate action. A strong public financing and investment in public infrastructure and services governed democratically is a much more effective way of, of reaching the, the SDGs. The business model of multilateral development bank should seek to definancialize development rather than to deepen the problematic financialization process that undermine rights. It is critical to, to push for no de-risking in social infrastructure, health, uh, education, and uh, biodiversity. They should not be considered uh, assets. Um, and then um, I think that it's very important for this group um, um, to elevate its voice uh, in relation to uh, the points that I have expressed um, uh, before in, uh, on um, deliver on unmet commitments and addressing systemic problems. Right, we cannot think about uh, uh, proposals that met a rights-based agenda without addressing those. The road ahead in 2023 includes the Paris summit, a very immediate uh, event, the um, uh, annual meetings in Marrakesh, COP28, but um, looking even beyond 2023, we certainly think that the announced fourth uh, UN Conference on Financing for Development is the process uh, or the event that could provide a venue for a truly intergovernmental process that is transparent and that involves meaningful engagement of um, uh, civil society. With this, um, I thank you for your attention and I really look forward to the conversation because I think that I just aim to, pro uh, to, to provide some um, general input to uh, frame the discussion, but the discussion will certainly be very rich. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria Jose. I really appreciate your overview of the processes and of um, what's problematic about them. I'm really, really grateful for your analysis and happy to have you with us. And I hope you'll stay on for the breakout so we can figure out kind of what to do with this information. So thank you very much. Um, we now turn to David Williams. David is the International Climate Justice Director for Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung to talk us through from more of the climate justice perspective about what this all means. So David, over to you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I hope you can see me okay. And I hope yeah. uh, my screen is shared. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. I feel really, uh, really privileged um, to be here in this uh, special space um, and to speaking um, uh, in front of so many uh, esteemed colleagues from whom I've learned so much over recent years. Um, uh, and yeah, I'm, I, my, my aim is just to add on to, to the awesome input just given by, um, by Maria Jose um, and, to, and to maybe um, sort of touch on a couple of climate justice um, um, aspects um, that we work with here um, at, uh, at, at RLS and to maybe um, sort of talk a bit about some other um, initiatives which are interesting because while, um, while Bridgetown is of course um, uh, gaining a lot of traction right now, um, it's not the only thing that's happening right now, and it's always being framed as a um, as something which has to be sort of one part of a of a wider structural approach. Um, so maybe talk about some of those things as well. Um, my personal background is actually in climate science, um, so I always like to start off um, uh, with some uh, climate graphics. Um, uh, so this is um, from the latest um, assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it just shows 
uh, in which regions of the world um, the incidence of floods, so caused through heavy precipitation, um, has increased since 1950. So climatologically speaking, it's a very short period of time, which should cause us to be concerned. Um, uh, and you can see here um, uh, the regions um, in, in which floods um, have been increasing. Um, similarly, for droughts, um, uh, through agricultural and ecological droughts, um, has also been increasing since the 1950s, um, particularly in the in the Southwest uh, African region and the Eastern Asian region, and then finally also uh, heat waves. Uh, heat waves have been increasing um, almost across the entire uh, world. Um, and the, um, the important thing about heat waves as well um, is that it's very, very strongly linked to um, uh, human-induced climate change. Um, it's directly caused um, by the greenhouse gas emissions that we are currently putting um, into the atmosphere. And this, so, so this is what's happened until now. And the impact of this, of course, haven't been, uh, haven't been shared equally across society. Um, particularly uh, women and, and gender diverse people um, have borne the brunt of this. Um, that's because in many regions of the world, there's a higher dependency on um, natural resources. Um, there's a much larger sus um, susceptibility to gender-based violence. Um, there's a higher vulnerability as well um, when these, when these um, extreme events happen. Um, and there's also much lower access to relief efforts um, after um, these, these really um, dramatic events have happened. Um, so that's until today. Um, and if we have a look into the future, then things, to be honest, don't look like they're going to get much better anytime soon right now, but things can always change. There's always hope. Um, but our um, overall greenhouse gas emissions have been rising steadily, uh, even over the past sort of 20 years when we know all about climate change and what greenhouse gas emissions are causing. Um, and this sort of shows that if we carry on with the implemented policies, um, we're going to reach between 2.2 degrees and 3.5 degrees warming by 2100. Um, and we can already see what the warming has caused now. Um, you can also see there what um, would be necessary um, to stay within two degrees uh, warming and 1.5 degrees warming um, within, um, within the uh, Paris alignment and um, within the Paris agreement. Um, so I, I always think it's important to, to mention this because, of course, this always has very different impacts locally. Um, in some cases, it's really dense cities which are trying to add um, green space to, to create cooling mechanisms um, for their cities. It's adding access to water. Um, it's trying to prevent um, communities from building houses close to uh, coastal areas where coastal erosion is being accelerated because of sea level rise. Um, it's building effective flood walls. It's very much um, an issue of um, both national, regional, and local governments having the capacity to respond adequately um, to these climate change impacts, um, which is a real problem right now. Um, if we're talking about who is vulnerable, I think this is one of the most interesting um, outputs of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of their most recent report. Um, which is essentially showing which countries um, are vulnerable to climate change impacts compared to which countries have, um, have emitted the most uh, CO2. Um, and you can see there's a large, there's, there's a large bunch of groups uh, of, 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 um, of countries sort of stacked up there on the, um, on the y-axis, on the um, on the on the vertical axis, whilst on the horizontal axis, there are sort of it's more sort of spread out. So the spread out dots are the are the Germany's, the UK, the Japan's, the USA. Um, whereas um, if you have a look actually at those countries which are bunched up there on the left, which have a high vulnerability to climate change yet have contributed very little to the issue, it's actually um, very reminiscent of this distribution here. Um, so. Um, this map shows those countries which have been colonized by Europe um, since 1450. Um, and um, what happened, of course, um, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, when, um, uh, when um, after long protracted struggles, um, the, uh, many governments managed to free themselves from the colonial oppression. Um, 
is that they incurred a lot of debt um, uh, and they had to borrow money from, um, from both private sectors and um, global north governments um, to be able to continue to finance their, their public systems. Um, uh, and through that, um, of course, the importance of the international finance architecture represented here for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank group is emphasized. Okay? Um, so it's essentially their job to sort of make sure that those countries which due to um, uh, uh, indebtedness caused um, by colonialism um, pay back loans, essentially. Um, this is a, a simplification, um, but for time's sake, I think I'll describe it like that. Um, as a general rule of thumb, if you hear the International Monetary Fund getting involved in anything, it's normally a bad sign. Um, and it's important because these two institutions are really key players in, in upholding the international financial system, right? They're completely embedded in these neoliberal market structures, um, which are really uh, preventing countries to take those necessary changes to protect their communities and their people from the impacts of climate change. Um, it's very much correlated with the debt crisis that we have today. And this is um, a map of the debt crisis by, by debt justice and sort of just portraying which countries, which regions um, are uh, both in debt crisis and at uh, acute risk of debt crisis. And for exactly those reasons, it's no surprise that there is a high correlation there's a, um, a, a between those countries which are um, which are vulnerable to climate change impacts and those countries which are in debt because it's completely constraining their ability to respond um, appropriately. It also makes it all the more worse that um, the current um, climate finance is being provided predominantly in loans and equity and, 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 and private finance, um, which all bring along this dependency mechanism that you have to pay back later, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes with interest, so it gets more and more that these countries have to pay back, um, as opposed to grants, which, which don't have this dependency. Um, that added on to the fact that um, um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development are sort of well known for overestimating of how much is being provided in climate finance, um, as opposed to very respectable um, NGOs like Oxfam, who have a bit more of a, a bit more of a grasp of, of what is actually flowing. Um, and, and this is all in the context of the 100 uh, billion US dollars, which was promised uh, in Copenhagen um, and uh, still hasn't been delivered upon. Um, this is, of course, being talked about slowly in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change negotiations. Um, this, is an, this is taken from the cover decision, which is like the main output document um, from COP27, um, where um, in paragraph 34, um, it, it, the, it's, it's, it's acknowledged that, um, that uh, adequate funding will require a transformation of the financial system um, and in paragraph 35, um, this, this um, growing gap is noted with concern uh, between the needs of developing country parties, in particular those due to the increasing impacts of climate change and their increased indebtedness. So it has been referred to, we can talk about um, the innovativeness of their suggestions to deal with this uh, issue maybe uh, in the breakout groups. Um, and another sort of um, slightly, I think some might say concerning uh, development is um, this paragraph 12 when it comes to the funding arrangements for loss and damage, um, where the uh, World Bank Group and the International Monetary Fund uh, are called upon um, to consider at the spring meetings, which are these sort of um, regular meetings held in Washington, D.C., or at least this year's was in Washington, D.C., um, uh, for the potential for such institutions to contribute to funding arrangements. And the problem with that is, of course, the neocolonial structure within which these financial institutions are embedded. I mean, the most um, concrete example is how the respective leaderships of these organizations are decided upon. Um, the World Bank Group is essentially always decided upon by the um, US uh, stakeholders and the International Monetary Fund is always decided upon, uh, upon by the European uh, stakeholders, which is the most obvious sort of sign of a lack of, dem uh, of, of, of democracy. Um, so this is a bit, you know, the, the, the context in which um, the, Bridgetown, the Bridgetown Initiative came to be. 
uh, Maria Jose has, has um, talked in depth about um, everything that it entails and the, um, the interesting things, the, um, the scary things that are in it. Uh, for me, you know, I'm, I'm not a complete expert in these kinds of processes. And for me, it was kind of a, a strange process of the Bridge Channel Initiative because it started off with like, a, like, an, like an opinion statement on a website and then it turned to like an online document which was sent around and then you were constantly thinking, oh, is this, you know, is this the final version? Was this meant to go out to everyone? Um, uh, yeah, but um, maybe that's normal. I don't know. Um, uh, but it did, uh, as Maria Jose said, uh, it did really, it was really hot on the news. Um, it was covered by many large media outlets, by many um, development think tanks. There's a lot of excitement about this. Uh, and I just like to briefly, um, um, towards the end of my input, just touch on a couple of things that perhaps um, could also be reflected upon. Um, like I said, the Bridge Hand Initiative is just one part of a um, of many different initiatives, which is which are really really necessary to um, to enforce the structural change which is needed to adequately um, uh, address uh, climate injustice. Um, and one thing which uh, sometimes um, isn't addressed as well in these kind of initiatives um, is this issue of fossil fuel uh, uh, fossil fuel companies, uh, particularly in the context of reparation, right? Um, there's this really interesting paper that, that came out, which actually added up if you take, if you add up all the climate damages caused uh, from cumulative emissions from, um, from the late 80s, um, uh, from these fossil fuel companies, uh, and then ranks these, these fossil fuel companies in, in, in terms of how much um, they actually owe um, to impacted communities. Um, just as a small side note as well, um, the head of this fossil fuel company will be the president of COP28. Um, so that's obviously also something um, which everyone is very concerned about. Um, that's one. That's one part. Um, a, a part of it. The other part is, of course, the um, uh, the the banking sector. Um, the banking on climate chaos came out very recently, um, in in which over five trillion um, uh, dollars was cited as uh, having been invested in fossil fuel companies um, since the Paris Agreement. Uh, I thought I'd take a screenshot of it just so that you can, because I don't know, in, in my head, I don't really know what 5 trillion looks like. So that's what 5 trillion looks like. Um, uh, looks like. Um, and uh, this is, again, something which is, it is quite difficult to address, but there are some initiatives um, which are quite interesting um, in, in that regard. Just as a small side note, the four worst banks, um, uh, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Citibank, um, you can see the respective um, in investments in, in fossil fuel companies there on the right. Um, they're all located very close to our office here in New York. So three of, their, um, three of them are, are, are headquartered very closely. So if you, if you have any ideas um, for, uh, I don't know, some cool on the ground actions, then please um, get in touch. Um, and then finally, I thought I'd um, I just briefly mention the UN Tax Convention. Um, which is an, uh, an initiative led by the African group at the, at the United Nations General Assembly, um, which, was, um, which was passed last year in October, which essentially attempts to bring the global regulatory framework from the OECD, the Organization for Economic, uh, uh, and, uh, for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, um, which is a very Eurocentric organization to the UN, which would mean um, it's a much more democratic, um, uh, democratic, democratic uh, process, including voices uh, and governments um, from the global south, which so far, um, uh, which so far is is lacking in global tax discussions. Um, and there are some really cool um, initiatives by the Global Alliance for Tax Justice, and particularly this one here, framing feminist taxation, um, which again, you know, refers to the problem of billions of U.S. dollars in public revenue being lost, um, and that and that this actually has the potential. Um, to uh, uh, to be a much larger economic force than, than aid or remittances and can sort of um, uh, be a source of sustainable government revenue and, and climate action. Um, and reframing this also has the potential to finally um, maybe account for unpaid care work, um, which is carried out by, by women and, and gender diverse people, which currently still remains pretty much invisible in the global economy. Um, and like I said, um, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for countries of the global south to actually have an equal say in tax negotiations. Um, I think I'll leave it there.
So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward um, to the discussions. Thank you, David. That was uh, really an incredible amount of information packed into your 15 minutes. So really very much appreciate the kind of context setting within the, the climate justice landscape, as well as pushing us to start um, surfacing some of the alternative proposals that already exist, um, like the, the feminist taxation resource um, and, and sort of other ways we could be addressing this, this history and ongoing colonialism um, and debt that are so entrenched with, with climate and with our, our um, economic and financial governance. So thank you. Um, let's, let me get my screen back up. Okay, great. So before we move into our breakout, as I mentioned, we now have a sort of transition moment with our colleague Melania Tupanda, who's the Climate Justice and Gender Advisor at FemNet. So Mello, we're very happy to have you with us today and the floor is yours for about 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Katie. And, and thank you very much, uh, David and, and Maria, Mariah Jose for the um, insightful presentations. Um, mine is not going to be a very complicated session, I mean presentation, because already a lot has been said. But what I, I just would like to draw our attention to is what has been said by Mariah Jose in her presentation about that a lot of the propositions that are being made currently they are looking at um, the financial sector and uh, market-driven uh, solutions to the climate crisis. And they have excluded a very critical constituency, which is the, the NGO sector, and let alone the, the feminist movement, that the exclusion of such critical voices are makes the, the initiatives very questionable, particularly when we are looking at uh, mechanisms and, and um, uh, a sector that has contributed to the, to the crisis that we are trusting the same uh, market-driven um, development initiatives to take us out of a crisis that was created by, by um, by the same institutions. And um, what I also would like just to draw our attention to is what has been shared by, by David, which is very critical within the feminist framing of uh, how we are envisioning uh, a climate just development um, uh, uh, model is the issue of colonialism. We all um, know that um, a lot of the countries that were under European colonial rule uh, inherited the colonial debt. Um, I just want to give an example of, of Zimbabwe and, and, and Kenya, uh, how we have inherited, Zimbabwe inherited 77 million um, um, from uh, the colonial administration in 1980. And from then we have never been able to pay back that debt. And what I, I would like us to look at and, and also to imagine is how, you know, we have had droughts. Uh, if we look at how in 1982, 1992, and then the, the, the droughts and the floods, they are increasing in, in, in frequency and, and in intensity. And therefore, when we look at how now the, the, the borrowing when, when countries have to deal with, with um, the climate induced disaster, which are largely naturalized. And that is part of the challenge. The moment we start to think about droughts, the moment we start to think about floods and the rising sea levels as, as natural uh, occurrences, then it ceases to be a, 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 a problem or an obligation to the institutions that pose the crisis. But what we want to, what we want to also uh, uh, look at in how we, we would like to imagine this is what David has said about the unpaid care work. 
So now let us look at uh, the period of uh, between 2019 and 2020, right? Uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, uh, there was a cyclone that was extremely destructive. And this uh, cyclone destroyed property infrastructure worth billions, right? And then in, 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 in 2020, we had the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. This is while we still had uh, uh, people in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique, and, and some parts of Malawi still living in temporary shelters. And when we look at who is carrying the burden of rebuilding communities, that burden was uh, 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 carried by, by, by women. The majority of who carried that burden, there were women involved in rebuilding their lives, rebuilding their livelihoods, rebuilding most of what has, has been destroyed, the, the, the social infrastructure, the women carrying the disproportionate burden. And when we look again at the COVID-19 pandemic, the violence, the increasing violence, the loss of livelihoods, the criminalization of, of, of um, uh, uh, women's livelihood projects, how the informal sector in Africa, a lot of, the, a lot of women are involved in the, in, in the informal sector, how this was criminalized, and also looking at how countries still get to borrow to respond to both the climate crisis and the, the COVID-19 pandemic and how women are carrying that burden. So for me to think about uh, the way we are envisioning um, uh, our propositions towards COP28 and our responses to the Bridgetown Initiative is we would like really to make it clear that when we talk about the climate crisis, we cannot not talk about the increase in women's unpaid care work, the increase in women's contributions to the economies, which is invisibilized. Because when we look at how, you know, the issue of debt, when um, uh, governments focus on debt repayment, what that means is they're unable to provide social services. They are unable to, to provide the, the, the public services. And what that means is women are going to improvise. Every time, you know, um, our, our governments are unable to provide clean water, they are unable to provide electricity, women end up improvising and, and, and are subsidizing what is supposed to be done by government. And therefore, who in reality is paying off the debt that countries are owing? A large part of it is paid by women through their unpaid care work. And when, when we start even looking at uh, the climate finance, whether it is going to come in the form of grants, when there is no clear political, uh, 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 when there is no politi uh, clear political commitment to say this, uh, 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 grants are supposed to be targeted at addressing the challenges women face, the challenges women face in terms of uh, 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 the climate crisis, in terms of addressing gender inequality, uh, 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 in terms of addressing even the exploitative nature, structural violence, the violence women face as a result of, of uh, 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 the tax burden. Uh, the climate crisis and, and, and also the other pandemics and even looking at the sh shortages, the, 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 the price hikes uh, as a result of the Ukrainian um, uh, Russian war, that negatively impacts on, on women's well-being and women's uh, uh, um, uh, 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 unpaid care work increases in the, in the process. So I just want us to, to, to start looking at all those components of when we would like to say this is a climate just development agenda, uh, uh, how do we make sure that firstly women have access to the, to, to the finance? And secondly, there is a very clear political commitment 
for that for that uh, finance to address the the, the 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 gender disparities that that are, are, are in our communities and in in in, uh, in in our countries and that um uh the other thing is that uh women are included in 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 in, in, in the visioning process of how do we uh, uh, want to frame the, the, the climate finance and, and, and also that uh, uh, we cannot have market oriented solutions to a crisis that was that was uh, uh, posed by a, a market driven development model and, and also the issue of, of, of um, climate reparations. These should really target um, uh, 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 the, the small island countries, but as well Africa and other countries in the, in the, in the global south. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Katie. Thank you so much, Mela. We really appreciate having you with us and, and hearing you share um, some of your expertise about how all of these pieces fit together. Um, very excited that a paper that Mela has written together with Anne Sangole, which goes over some of this um, triple crisis of, of debt, COVID, and climate that Mela was speaking about uh, with case studies from Zimbabwe and Kenya, will be published um, as an Action Nexus advocacy brief within the next couple of weeks. So we'll be sharing that with all of you in, in English, French, and Spanish. So we're, we're thrilled to, to be able to share that analysis. So thank you very much once again to Maria Jose, to David, and to Mela for getting us started with um, lots and lots to think about as we get into uh, the breakout groups. Thank you all so much. Um, so for this next almost hour, it's now to us to, to collectively digest what we've heard and, and to think about what we, what we want to do in terms of potential collective advocacy or, or our own analysis around Bridgetown, around the new Global Financial Pact Summit, um, et cetera. So we're going to move into discussion groups. We're gonna have four groups of about 15 to 20 participants each. Um, in the main room, Carla Mejia from Latin Dad will be our facilitator. And if you need interpretation, please stay in the main room. So I've set up the breakout groups to, to move people around. And I think I've done it correctly so that if you need interpretation, you will automatically stay. But if you find yourself in a breakout room, um, because the ones that Zukiswa, Kathy, and Gina will facilitate will be in English, you can always leave and go back to the main room if you need interpretation. Okay, so the facilitators will explain that again, but you will automatically be moved and you will stay in the main room if you need interpretation. So what are we gonna discuss in the, in the breakout groups? We have three questions, about 10 minutes per question, maybe about nine minutes per question. Um, and we're gonna look at sort of what are our key concerns from a feminist perspective that you think we should tackle collectively. We heard lots of concerns from our three presenters and, and what are the ones that we want to kind of crystallize our, our thinking around. And then what would a collective res feminist response to Bridgetown look like? Do we wanna do um, a kind of annotated critique of the latest draft? Do we wanna do social media? Do we want, as David was saying, to have you know mobilizations and actions in front of, um, the polluting or the fossil fuel investing banks? What do we want to do at Marrakesh, at COP? What are, and, and sort of what are the three to five perhaps demands that we would want to surface? And we may not, we may not get to this level of, um, of detail, but we can at least start to frame um, some collective concerns. And then an opportunity to share any ideas for an event, um, for an op-ed, for a social media campaign, um, that would kind of follow on from this. So we have a really nice trajectory, as Maria Jose mentioned, from the, the two webinars in April and May that Eurodad and other partners convened. We have this teach-in and strategy session. I think next we're thinking of some more in-depth um, analysis on debt, care, and climate in particular, since that's really kind of at the crux of so many of these issues. But 
there's we'll have the opportunity to share, you know, what you think we should do, what examples um, and suggestions you might have. And then we also have a Padlet. And thanks, Lindsay, for putting the link in the chat. So this is where we'll take notes during the breakout. So each facilitator, please designate someone to take notes into the Padlet. And we also um, have an opportunity to add any links to resources that you might want to share, especially of, of national level feminist advocacy that it would be helpful for others to know about. And then we can also, by commenting on the Padlet, um, add in which of us are planning to be at the Paris Summit, at the Regional Climate Weeks, at Marrakesh Annual Meetings, and at COP, and then that can also help us kind of take the conversation forward from there. So, before we get to next steps, I would love to hear just a little bit about what each group discussed. Um, a reminder for those coming back to the main room, if you need interpretation, please reactivate the interpretation. So click interpretation and choose the language you'd like to listen in, including English, because when you come back to the main room, you have to do it again. Yeah. So I'm going to give each group just one minute to share some highlights and reflections. And please note that we'll keep the Padlet open. So if you didn't get to finish or if there's more you wanted to say, I'll send it out over email with a reminder to fill it in so that we can have this resource um, for collective thinking to continue. So maybe I'll start with Gina. Um, if you or someone from your group wants to give us a one minute snapshot of the discussion, over to you. Oh my God, it's going to be super difficult. I'm just reading back to the notes because we discussed a lot, but I will try to summarize it in one, two minutes. And we, with the first question, we kind of started discussing about the evolution of the Bridgetown itself on how at the beginning, it sounded like something coming from the global South that could be transformative, but it has been very diluted and instrumentalized. And actually coming from the, at the end of the day, it does not really reflect global South demand demands, no? So how a, in a process of advocacy critique and so on and so forth, it could be a reclaim to a reclaiming that Southern, let's say, transformational essence that at any point that initiative could have had, let's say. Um, also, we were uh, discussing about you know, the, that collective feminist response, collective feminist response that during the discussion it brought to the table many different issues, such as, for example, the amount of money that is flowing right now in terms of war, you no, know, that has been investing on war, and how our country is still saying, oh no, but um, we we are um, having in our countries people. Uh, that are hungry or that are not fulfilling different type of needs. So how this contrast, you no, know, in terms of where the financial flows are flowing, it's really uh, critical in terms of uh, this feminist uh, analysis and how then one kind of of, of a commonality or a common voice within the discussion was the need of bringing that feminist critique to the Bridgetown Initiative, no, um, on how, what are the development paradigms that this is really implying and how is really this being transformative because it's not transformative at all on looking to giving back the power to the people, but really understanding that this is just a proposal in this same uh, broken and uh, market-based system that are actually, is the issue itself, no? And um, then there have been other yeah, different discussions about debt and taxes and a care economy, a care economy and not a carbon economy that can also nurture those feminist perspective into the into the discussions. And um, uh, let me check a little bit more. Also, the call for accountability from communities know how I think that it was also mentioned during the plenaries but how this process has not been participatory at all and even though it was kind of led by Barbados it doesn't mean that it has been participative in the process no come bringing a uh, other southern voices in the process of and how accountability is also a uh, very crucial and there have been other different yeah topics coming on but I think I already took like five minutes <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Gina. Yeah, so much rich discussion and, and similar to what we discussed in our group as well. Thank you. Kathy, over to your group. 
Well, I think one minute is impossible, but thanks everyone for the great inputs. Um, and I think it's just so great to see, you know, this huge interest from, from folks too um, in, in this session. Um, so I'll try to kind of just um, go through some buzzwords and, and all the key points that I can remember. Um, and the first being advocating for windfall tax to be applied and to be um, highlighted in this initiative and also the need to support rural women and their access to finance, um, and also that the Barbados Initiative currently doesn't have a strong gender lens, um, including from the working group, so society representatives, um, and the importance that um, the initiative and the wider international financial system reform needs to deliver a system systemic reform. Um, and also folks mentioned challenges from um, people in Barbados finding it challenging to get information from their own government on this initiative, um, and also whether this initiative still plays a key role in internationally um, on this agenda, given that, for example, um, Mia Motley's role is not as strong in the incoming Paris summit um, as probably half a year ago. Um, and folks also mentioned there's a WhatsApp group. Um, I think it was for the Paris summit, um, and I believe, um, it's been shared um, here as well by Naomi. And, um, and also that, again, folks also mentioned the importance of care economy and also finding it an opportunity to link care work with climate um, discussions. And also that, again, in the working groups of the Bridgetown Initiative, that many um, the civil society re representatives do not necessarily have a strong gender focus um, or they might not represent actual civil society stakeholders, they might be, for example, think tanks or NGOs that are not very civil society focused and uh, does, or does not come from a um, rights or justice focused lens. Um, and also, of course, the importance of debt justice and also avoid private sector and market driven model um, and also avoid, you know, focusing on purely on blended or private finance. Um, and also a really interesting point that I found is um, about indirect subsidies, um, especially related to plastic production. Um, and last but not the least, recognizing that education and health shouldn't be an asset class for private sector's demands uh, on de-risking. And last point in terms of um, in terms of other opportunities within um, the UN, there are, for example, the SDG summit and um, the FFD um, related opportunities as well. Hope Thanks. this is Thanks. short. Yeah, thank you. And we've captured um, in the Padlet and we'll continue to. Thanks, Kathy. Zuki Swap? Um, thank you so much, colleagues. So uh, we had an incredible discussion and because of time, you know, I will be like two minutes, but um, I think one thing, I won't repeat what other colleagues have said, but one thing that we, you know, said is, a, is an important uh, entry point, but clearly in the question around demands is that at the first instance, is the feminist position that we are rejecting the initiative or are we proposing reform? Because that is, answering that question is going to fundamentally inform how we then move together towards, you know, um, um, uh, 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 how we engage this initiative. So are we asking our leaders to go back to the initial draft and insisting on that as a demand to say that, how do we maintain the integrity of what was once, you know, an opportunity for a more hopeful radical propositioning that moves us to where we've always said we wanted to go, which was a complete overhaul of the financial system or are we going to say that you know a good strategy would be to push for some of the more clearer things put on the table that we agree on so fundamentally get to that conversation are we rejecting are we reforming and if so what does that mean for what we're putting forward um and then I will, like I said, I won't mention what colleagues have mentioned, but um, a, a core theme that came out uh, from our group discussion was how do we take back um, these things to the multilateral process, right? So how do we insist as a core demand that even though this wasn't imagined as this, but because it is now this, we need to insist on representation of voices and meaning particip meaningful participation of civil society, um, because this is a global issue and it demands a global response. And the best mechanisms for that is the multilateral process. So how do we insist on that as a core demand to ensure that we are able to get our voices in and that it is not an exercise that is more backdoor where the paternalistic culture of the West, where a South leadership 
South perspective puts a solution on the table. And once again, it has to go through the approval of the North who caused the crisis before it is taken seriously. So that should be another core demand that we are saying that you're actually not going to, you know, wait until this thing is sexy um, so that you can take action. This is a global South led initiative and it is absolutely imperative that that integrity of this initiative be maintained as such. Um, and so the idea that the North leads while the South leads, even as we do the thinking work is something that we should um, quickly undermine. And mm -hmm. finally, again, um, yeah, I think the other issues around the gender uh, focus, the other issues around um, really being clear about debt cancellation and debt reparations as a core demand um, have been engaged by other colleagues. And I'm very glad that the panel will be available. My group you were amazing. And thank you, Katie, uh, for Thanks. creating this opportunity. Over to um, Carola. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. So we, I realize we're at time and I really apologize for that. I'm going to give the floor to Carola to share from the last group and also to share any other perspectives because Carola has been involved with the, the previous webinars organized by Eurodad, Latin Dad, and others as well. So Carola, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. And thank you for all the people that, uh, that shared the inputs uh, in our group. It was a very interesting discussion. Uh, the, uh, within the concerns, we uh, discuss about how debt affects, uh, especially disproportion disproportionately, uh, women and people with disabilities, and how we need to address this also uh, with the climate uh, crisis affecting disproportionately women. Uh, uh, women are not being recognized, they are not uh, being part of decision making processes, they are not part of the fair distribution of resources despite the fact that they are so important for the for the economy itself and for the, the society. So we need to, to, to break that cycle. Uh, uh, we, we discussed about how important it is to guarantee the provision of climate finance in the form of grants, uh, how to advocate for a policy that can guarantee the access to, of this, to these grants and this finance for the people that is being most affected by this disasters and, and especially women and you know their, their diversities. We spoke about uh, the importance of debt cancellation and the recognition of this uh, ecological and historical uh, climate debt the North has with the South and these uh, processes and initiatives like the Bridgetown, like the Paris Summit, should not we, sh we should not allow them to take us away from this uh, common but differentiated responsibilities principle but for the climate justice principles they cannot distract us from other official spaces that could be more helpful to take these decisions and and to promote a real reform and uh, we talked about uh, the growth and how the north should be reducing their consumption their emissions to stop climate uh, the climate crisis and to uh, with that, the, the need we have to change the capitalist uh, model. Uh, we also talk about the importance of a fiscal global uh, pact uh, and, and, and policy that has in the center the sustain life sustainability, which is something that is not happening. We discuss about the role of the private sector as well. And, and what, uh, something I, I mentioned is that granting them so much power and thinking that they will solve everything is not real because especially if we are considering here adaptation, loss and damage, resilience, they are not going to invest in those kind of things if they don't receive profit uh, from that. Uh, we should make politicians uh, sh uh, should be held accountable from the, what they do and the decisions that they are taking. Um, we should bring fair trade movements to the table and to these kind of discussions. We talked about some uh, ideas to 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 uh, raise our voices, uh, for example, organization of workshops, uh, newsletters translated to different uh, local languages, also to involve people from the rural areas, women from the rural areas that are being affected, uh, also to consult with uh, uh, social feminine uh, corporations and small uh, companies that also need this access to, to this uh, fin funding. And, and not only think about grants, but also the access to financial uh, institutions, financial credits, for example, for these companies uh, of, of women, it could be important. And yeah, and I, I'm sure I left many things <laughs> aside, but yeah, that, that's uh, something that I can summarize. Thank you, Kate. Perfect. Thank you so much, Carola. Thank you very much to all of our facilitators, Carola, Zukiswa, Kathy, and Gina. Um, thank you to all of you for being with us for over two hours. And apologies again for, for going over. 
thank you very, very much to our interpreters. It is always a challenging task with so many of us for so long, such complex conversations. Um, we really look forward to continuing the work together. So I'll send a, an email with the resources, with the Padlet, um, in translated into the, the four languages that we've been working in today. And we'd really like to hear about any um, upcoming plans for these spaces so we can continue the conversation on the Action Nexus listserv and on the advocacy listserv of the women and gender constituency. And we'll also send um, information on how to join those listservs if you're not on them already. So yes, the Padlet is still open. Please keep adding your thoughts and your plans. And thank you so very much, everyone, for, for creating the space with us today. Really very much appreciate it. Thank you again to our, our teach-in presenters and to all of you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.